Good morning. Good morning. We will be starting in just about two minutes, two minutes before we begin our session this morning. I want to make sure that our SPS TV crew is ready to go. We are carrying this session live on YouTube. Oh, it, be back in just about two minutes and we'll be ready to start. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Happy Saturday and welcome to Chief CL High School. I hope that you are doing incredibly well. I am Bev Redmond, your Chief of Staff serving Seattle Public Schools. Thank you for giving us a part of your weekend to discuss a very, very important topic. Before we begin, I want to make sure that we have all of our family here, our community served in terms of language needs. Our interpretation team, would you please come to the front? You're here, oh, wonderful, thank you. Each will make a special announcement for anyone needing language services at this time. Hola, buenos días. Gracias por acompañarnos. Mi nombre es Lorena y voy a estarles ayudando en la interpretación de español. Si necesitan ayuda, eh, podemos tomar los auriculares en la parte de atrás. Gracias. Xin chào quý vị. Tôi là Lenny. Sẽ là thông dịch viên tiếng Việt cho ngày cho buổi họp ngày hôm nay. Nếu quý vị nào cần thông dịch viên, xin hãy tới cái bàn ở phía sau đây để nhận được sự hỗ trợ tiếng Việt. Xin cảm ơn. Assalamu alaikum. Mời các anh qua hàng lên. Mời các anh 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 lên. Mời các anh大家好，我系Michael。如果大家想听正宗嘅广东话，请你去后边攞个耳机坐好，就可以即场翻译。would you please give a round of applause for our interpretation team? I would like any of our staff members today who are helping to make this event possible, if you would stand or just wave your hand. It took a lot of moments to get this together for you. And we appreciate them sacrificing their time to help us make this possible. Again, my name is Bev Redmond, Chief of Staff for Seattle Public Schools. It is my honor to stand in this space. And as we begin any of our events, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and the traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people.
This afternoon or this morning, we are here to discuss something very close and near to your hearts, our schools. This is an important conversation, an important set of information that we want to share with you about making Seattle Public Schools stronger for years to come. I want to go over what we will experience today in this space. Through our agenda, we're in the opening remarks phase, of course. Then we will hear for, from our superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones. He will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we are going to go into conversation on sharing ideas and questions. Would our table captains please raise your hand? If you are not at a space, when we get to that portion of the conversation, if you're not at a table with a table captain, it's okay to move so that we can have that conversation with you together. And then we will have a question and answer session with Dr. Jones and our senior leadership team. We have a pretty full morning. We will take the entire time and we will make sure that we get to as many of your questions as possible. Any questions that we cannot answer just because of time, we will make sure that we have those collected and we will add those again to our FAQ. It's now it's time to start. Well, I am going to turn the microphone over to our superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones. Thank you, Bev, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is a, a really important uh, conversation we're having. And uh, we've uh, had, this is the number three of four sessions that we're gonna have to really share some information, share some context, uh, and then get into some question and answers, as Bev mentioned. And so hopefully we're gonna be in a space where we can uh, convey the why of what we're doing, and then we can hear from you all as to just what's, what's, what are some of your concerns and what are you thinking about? And this is a multi-step process of getting from a place of uh, what I would call instability to stability. And so, uh, again, thank you for your time on this Saturday morning, and uh, we'll get started. So I have about uh, 20 slides, but I will be here for about, and I'll be here about 20 minutes. So one thing I just want to say is we are in a state of instability financially, and we've had a structural deficit for many years but we've been able to kind of mask that a little bit with one-time funds, one-time federal funds, one-time state funds, but those funds have run out. And so over the last couple of years, we've been working to really uh, bring balanced budgets forward. And at the same time, we're working on how do we reduce a structural deficit? And the structural deficit is one that your, your expenditures are more than your revenue. And so we are experiencing uh, inflation, rising cost of living, we're experiencing our budgets not being fully funded. We're experiencing a reduction in school age population in the city and simply uh, en enrollment decline. We're not the only state uh, that's experiencing this. We're not the only, we're not, it's all across the nation. Uh, our our sistering neighborhood uh, districts are also experiencing this as well. And so we're trying to make, do our best to, to bring stability forward. So uh, generally we had a, this slide is, is this essentially, we had a $131 million deficit for 23-24. Uh, I went before the board, the board gave me direction to come up with strategies to reduce that, uh, re to, to address that deficit. We, got, we submitted a balanced budget. Uh, during this process, we started to ask community, what is important to you? What, what a well-resourced school look like? And so as we were looking at uh, the budget crisis, if you will, we said, let's, let's lean into that and say, how do we want to spend our funds? How do we want to spend our resources? What is the community saying the priorities are? And so we talked to, we talked to about 4,000 people, had about 10,000 responses, and they gave us some insight into what would a well-resourced school look like? And so as we get to this year, we have a $105, $105 million challenge before us. And so the board gave, gave me and us direction again, come up with some strategies to balance uh, the $105 million budget deficit that we've had. Uh, 
And so we'll be uh, giving the board our plan uh, in June to balance the 24-25 budget. And so in the state of Washington, you cannot submit a budget that's unbalanced. So we have to balance budgets every year. And we had to do a lot of things to really get into a balanced budget, but I think we were, we were wise in how we did that. And now we're faced with the challenge of how do we bring stability forward for the, for the subsequent years? With that being said, we're at a decision point. And the decision point is we can maintain the current system of schools, continue with 105 schools, 29 schools under 300 students, or, and we, we would have to continue to reduce school staffing to increase elementary and secondary school class sizes, reduce or eliminate preschools, uh, reduce or eliminate athletic and after school programs, uh, have additional reductions to central office, which is we're in our fourth year of central office reductions, uh, curriculum adoptions, operation staff, all these will be faced with reductions. And, the one, and another thing that we'd have to consider is renegotiating contracts. So if you look at the other side of that uh, decision point, we can look at a transition to a system of well-resourced schools, uh, which would facilitate expansion of elementary strategies across our district, which would, our, which would provide, excuse me, a, an equitable and consistent mix of services across all of our schools. We would have consistent, stable, and comprehensive school staffing. So many of our schools experience the annual October shuffle where we have to uh, disrupt the, the, the smooth operations of our schools because we have to shift staffing because of, uh, el excuse me, enrollment. Stable and balanced budget districts, uh, uh, budget for our districts and schools. It would be nice to have our schools have some predictability and consistency about their budgets every year. We think we can do this if we think about how do we consolidate our schools into uh, the right sizes. Next slide, please. So a system of well-resourced schools is essentially about stability and sustainability. It's not about creating extra resources. It's about using our resources wisely that we have right now. And so as we look at uh, this concept of school consolidations, it's in the context of a bigger uh, set of circumstances that we need to make sure that we're looking at when we're talking about st stability and sustainability. We need to look at governance and what are we doing uh, from a policy perspective. We need to look at funding. How do we look at our, our funding fiscal situation from a multi-year perspective? We need to make sure that our levy passes. We need to make sure that we have uh, a strong legislative push to make sure we're fully funding education. We need to make sure that when we're talking to our philanthropic partners, they can help us fund the innovation and the sustain the innovation that we've had in all of our elementary schools. We need to make sure that we have, as I talked about, predictable school allocations so that we don't, we're not disrupting uh, school business every year, every October. Our, our community told us that they want to have music, PE, and art at every elementary school. So I think this is a way that we might be able to do that. As we look at programs, we are required and we're honored to do it, but to have enduring programs around special education and inclusion. Our English language learners, uh, they need to experience uh, strong programs. Our highly capable uh, programs, we wanna make sure that students can have access to that on a regular and routine basis. And mental health is something that we're really working hard to make sure that we sustain services for our students. And then, of course, consolidations is part of a bigger picture, but we also need to be looking at transportation efficiency. Safety is an issue that we have to manage this year and in previous years, but it's something that's prevalent right now. And then artificial intelligence, that's something else that we need to be looking at. And so when we look at the concept of sustainability, we're looking at a whole lot of different factors when we do, when we do that. So our current situation, SPS has about 48,000 students, uh, 105 school buildings, and 73 of those buildings serve our preschool through fifth grade students. 29 of our schools, as I mentioned earlier, serve less than 300 students. Our proposed plan will consolidate schools serving K-5, uh, K through five students in 25, 26. So this is a, oh wow. This is an area what I want to focus on 
this is, these are the guiding principles. This is what we're using to think about a system of well-resourced schools. How do we achieve inclusive learning? How do we achieve special education and inclusionary practices? Looking at our multilingual learners, how do we provide enduring program, programmatic services for them? How do we expand access to advanced learning? Looking at strengthening and stabilizing our neighborhood schools. Next slide, please. Building condition and learning, learning environment, aligning to pro programmatic, aligning to uh, projected enrollment, looking at building capacity, service area capacity, equitable systems, equitable regional distribution. And so these are the criteria that we're using as we go forward in building this model for uh, a system of well-resourced schools. Thank you, Marty. So policy 2200 is really a policy that's driving our operational effort as we develop this plan, along with the guiding principles. How are we supporting district-wide academic goals? L looking at placing programs equitably across the districts, across the district where students res reside. One thing that we are uh, wedded to at Seattle Public Schools is equity, and one of the basic tenets of equity is making sure our students have access to programs and services. We want to make sure we're using our physical space resources effectively for, uh, to assure that instructional and program spaces are equitably met. And lastly, we want to ensure that our fiscal resources are taken into consideration. And that's, what's, that's what prompted this in the first place. Next slide, please. So a system of well-resourced schools is a new model that will have fewer buildings that serve pre-K to five, five fifth grade students. Each building capacity will be better aligned with enrollment. Schools will have more students, but they will not be overcrowded. And as we think about uh, moving to a system of well-resourced schools, our schools will be slightly larger, but they won't be giant schools. These will be mid-sized schools, in fact. And I'll show you a slide coming up that shows how we would achieve that. So our schools will not, uh, schools not in use, they will be secured and we will repurpose them until we need them again. So we're gonna inventory our schools. We're not gonna get rid of our schools. We're not gonna sell off our schools. We are gonna keep those in inventory. Next slide, please. So this is what the, uh, we have 4,000 people, as I mentioned, give us about 10,000 responses and told us what they'd like to see in a well-resourced school. Multiple teachers per grade level, stable support staff, inclusive learning for every student, social and emotional learning support, art, music, and PE teachers, uh, stable operational budgets from year to year, safe, healthy, and beautiful school grounds, and connections to the community. So this is the essence of what we're trying to achieve when we start talking about what would a well-resourced school look like. And some of our schools probably be, could be considered to be well-resourced, but they're not well-resourced with stable funding. They might be well-resourced with the generosity of some of our communities that have come forward to plug some of the gaps in, in staffing. But we wanna make sure that all of our schools have consistent, predictable funding, consistent and predictable staffing as we move forward. So this is what a well-resourced school looks like. Next slide, please. So as we look at this slide really is indicative of four different current elementary schools in Seattle. And so, from the left to the right, you have a school of 515 students, 468 students, 230 students, and 165 students. And what's, unique, what's interesting about this, or not interesting, is if you look at, from the left to the right, you'll see that the staffing for a school that's larger gives us the ability to have uh, consistency of, of uh, staffing. So if you look at from the top to the bottom, multiple teachers per grade level. That's really important for teachers to be able to collaborate, for them to be able to have grade level interventions, for them to be able to think about strategies together uh, per grade level. Stable staffing support. Many of our, uh, our larger schools, if you will, have an AP and office staff. The schools that are smaller may have uh, 0.5 office staff and no AP. If you look at inclusive learning, which is really important, we can have special education intensive service classrooms for those students who need and deserve that type of support. 
in social emotional learning, some of our schools don't have full-time counselors or social workers. And so as we look at this model going from left to right, I think the, the, the allocation that we get from the state is around 400 students. That's the prototypical model. And so we're looking at, as we think about consolidation, how do we get to a, a size of around 400, 400 students? Next slide, please. So the bigger picture is we have approximately 23,000 uh, pre-K through five students in our, in our buildings. They're currently served in more than 70 sites. And we're, our site utilization is, is about 65%. If we transition to a system of well-resourced schools for 25, 26, we'd be looking at uh, accommodating those students, K-5 students, in approximately 50 sites, evenly distributed throughout our regions. And this projected site utilization would be about 85%. So the math is pretty clear on what this looks like, and uh, we're trying to really maximize our resources so our students get the services and programs they deserve. So why consolidation? Uh, too many scholars that serve our youngest, too many schools that serve our youngest scholars are under-enrolled. Empty seats can lead to fewer staffing resources, more staffing adjustments, inequitable offerings across our district. If we maintain the status quo, as I mentioned before, this could mean having more students per teacher, reducing core school staff, and scaling back preschool offerings, just to say a few of those. So we're in the process, of, we're in the planning timeline here to really bring forward a plan to the board. Our, our board has tasked me and us to come up with the plan. And we're in that phase right now where we're coming up with the plan. We have several scenarios that we're working on. We're honing in on what that package is gonna look like. We're doing that right now. In May, uh, got approval from the board and direction from the board to proceed with this concept of uh, school, cons school consolidation. Now we're having the community meetings right now to share information with you all around that status. When we get to June, or we're in June now, I guess it's June 1st, we're going to present the plan to the board to say, here's what uh, our response is to the directive that you've given us. In June through November, uh, if assuming the board approves a plan, there'll be opportunities for uh, public review, um, we'll have uh, uh, site hearings, and then in November, that's the, that's the point where the board will make a decision that we're gonna go full board with a plan. So bottom line is, and I think you all agree, every student deserves a well-resourced school. And as I shared with the other, the other sessions, I get the complexity and, and the change and the difficulty for change uh, I even shared that as a student, I've had, I had to change schools four times, and it was very disruptive. Uh, however, I count on my teachers. My teachers, even back uh, a few years ago when I was a student, we, we developed community. We developed the things that we needed to do to come together. Our, princi our principals held us together. I was, I was even a, a student during desegregation, and I got bused from the south end to the north end. That was completely disruptive to a lot of the adults. But our, us as students, we figured it out. And so I think these changes can be enduring. I think these changes can be good for us, ultimately. I know it's gonna be difficult from the, from the, at the beginning, at the outset, but at the end, I think we're gonna have a system, a system of well-resourced schools. And so I'm inviting you all to kind of come along on this journey with us. Uh, you know that this wouldn't be my first choice to, to decide to look at consolidating schools. If there was, a, if there was a, a, a better, more enduring, comprehensive way, we would have already put that on the table. Maybe some of you have some brilliant ideas on how we can have a, a broad-based coalition of folks coming up with a plan that's enduring, but right now we haven't seen it. And so my board has given me the unenviable task, the honorable task, however, of coming up with a plan to develop a system of well-resourced schools. So I wanna just thank you for your time today. We're gonna to move into some question and answers. So if you all have uh, questions that you've written down, you have burning, burning questions that have come to your mind right now, we're ready to try to respond to those. 
And when those we don't have answers to, we'll help that'll help populate our FAQs and we'll get back to you with answers later. So again, thank you all for being here and thank you for being invested in what we're trying to do. One, two, all right. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> We're gonna transition uh, and take just a moment to do two things. We want to react to what we've just heard, and then we want to surface any questions that you may have that we have not been able to answer as of yet. So we're going to have our table captains lightly facilitate a quick discussion for about roughly 15 minutes. Um, this is an opportunity for you to, again, react to what you just heard and to surface any questions that you may have that you need us to answer for you. Um, and so we'll take a few minutes. There are cards on your table. If you need more cards along the way, let us know. Um, preferably you'll write one question per card. We will have uh, some people kind of ro roving around, if you will, to collect those cards. And then we're going to batch those and answer some of the frequently asked questions, as many of those as we can um, after this time period, okay? So we'll move into that. And then after about 15 minutes, we'll come together and a panel will answer some of the questions that we've brought forward. Thank you. So as you are hard at work with your questions and comments, I do want to point out that we have some light snacks, some light refreshments behind the stairs here, if you're interested.
We have about one more minute, one more minute, and then we'll be transitioning into the question and answer panel. So if you could write your final questions down, I'll come around and collect those from you. I greatly appreciate it. Okay. Rich conversations happening, and we greatly appreciate that. We are going to transition over to the question and answer panel. If you have any final questions that you've written down, we'll come around and pick those up. But I'd like to direct your attention to the front where we'll have a question and answer panel. Also a reminder, that we uh, have some snacks and water right here. <laughs> That's important, right? So I'll take that. Thank you. our panelists would please come to the front so that we can begin the question and answer session. Dr. Buttleman. Dr. Buttleman.
All right, thank you all so very much for, sh for being here today, for bringing your voice. Um, it's really critical. I'm uh, Marnie Campbell, Executive Director of Operations um, for Seattle Public Schools, and we will have everyone on this panel introduce themselves and what they do in the school district. Uh, James Mercer, Regional Executive Director of Schools for the Central Region. I'm Kirk, Kirk Fettelman, the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and proud parent of two Seattle Public School graduates, Whittier Wildcats and Ballard Beavers. Brent Jones, Superintendent. Uh, good morning, everyone. Fred Podesta, uh, Seattle Public Schools Chief Operations Officer. So thank you for bringing your questions here this morning. Our goal is to make sure that your voices are heard. Um, we will read questions and we've sorted them. There are many, many duplicates. We wanna make sure that we get to as many, a variety of questions as possible. We also wanna make sure that we are hearing from all of you. So we will stick to reading these questions and responding to them um, until 11, uh, or sorry, until 11.55. We have also sorted questions that pertain to the district as a whole. Many of you asked questions about your specific school, um, which we will follow up with as well. But if, since this is a large group representing a large group from our school district, we will focus on those questions that, that deal with our school system. And especially since we're talking about creating a system of well-resourced schools, we will be um, documenting and typing up every single question that we get so that we have that uh, information and data as we move forward. So the first question um, is uh, for, it might be a good one for Dr. Jones, but it's, it's for all of us to really deeply consider. Change is hard. Our children deserve better services and more stable services at every school. Please make a plan to build something better. Yes, uh, agreed, and uh, that that's the intent of this effort. Uh, you'll hear me be a broken record talking about stability, sustainability, consistency. And one of the things I, I didn't mention at the outset is this is about the student's experience. And we wanna make sure that we're centering the students in every decision that we're making. And so that, that's, a, that's a change for us. Uh, our new governance model, uh, has our board focused on student outcomes. Before we were focused on out, just, just activities, policies that may or may not be focusing on students. Sometimes it were things that were convenient. Now we're really uh, calibrated to focus on outcomes for students. And so as we think about this, this transition, as we think about these changes, we're putting the students' experience first and foremost in how we're making decisions. So. That was a statement that somebody sent forward and, and we're in 100% agreement, thank you. Thank you. The next question, will we get any transparency into what other options have been considered outside of closing or consolidating schools? Yes, and so uh, I'm not trying to be flippant when I say this, but we have looked at other options and we have not come up with another comprehensive option. Uh, if there was one, believe me, I have uh, a very uh, brilliant set of thinkers around me. Uh, people in the community have great ideas, yet nothing has come forward that would suggest this is an alternative to doing the reductions that we're talking about. And so, uh, again, I mentioned that this isn't the number one thing that I would want to do in terms of going forward, yet there hasn't been a, a plan or an alternative that has emerged for us to go forward. So we believe in this in terms of it will get us to stability, but it won't get us to the outcomes that we want. So we still need support, we still need funding, we still need resources, but at, right now this is frankly our best thinking in, in order to respond to the current situation. Anybody else want to add to that? I can add to that. I think part of the question was details on potential options. So on the website, there's a frequently asked questions page. And on one of those is sort of the left side of that um, decision point slide that Dr. Jones was showing. And some more detail around what different things might save for the district in terms of cost savings categorized by, these may save more than $5 million. These may save between one and five million and these are less than a million dollars. So there's some more detail out there 
on the website around some of the, the details of some of the things that um, sort of were the left side of that decision point around class sizes and other options. Thank you. And there was a related question that I'll read. Will the district show what savings per year will come with all these changes, along with detailed analysis used to calculate the savings? Is it through fewer staffing? So there's a couple of questions. Will we show that detailed savings, detailed analysis, and then or is it just through st uh, staffing reduction? So this question has come up a lot already. Um, so part of the answer is when there's a formal proposal from Dr. Jones to the board, we'll have details on those specific sites. Um, in response to this question that's come up the last few days, um, we added some information on the website last night around sort of what a typical school cost looks like um, and what the savings might um, be for those. Um, so about two thirds of the savings of a school. So closing a typical school would cost, save about a million five hundred thousand dollars in the operations of that school that are unique to that site. Um, and about two thirds of that is sort of the operations of the school, maintenance, um, culinary services, um, utilities, IT, grounds, um, custodial, those types of things, about two thirds of that would be saved. Um, even planning for some of the ongoing maintenance for a closed building and some of the utility costs of maintaining that building um, should it be needed to use in past. So netting those out, about two thirds of the savings would be from those types of things. About 25% would be for the operations of the principal's office. So the principal's jobs, the office support jobs, um, those jobs um, and staff jobs would be saved um, in closing a school and then teaching support. So some of the things that go along with operations for the school and the classroom supports for that individual site um, that wouldn't need to be duplicated at uh, a larger site with the consolidation of schools. So there's more detail on that in the, on the website now and going forward once there's more detail on uh, specific sites that are being discussed. They'll have more and more detail on that as well if that's needed. Thank you. Any further on that? What is going to happen with the schools that are closing down and what are the conditions of the closing schools? So maybe I'll take the second question first. Um, the building condition is uh, one of the guiding principles that Dr. Jones um, describes. So, um, uh, you know, buildings that are, are uh, too small to ever support all the services we want to offer in a building or their condition, um, uh, you know, the, the building condition is not good or the building design um, does not uh, conform to the best educational environment. That's part of the factors that we're thinking about in which buildings would be closed. If a site is closed, um, as Dr. Jones mentioned, the, there'll really be a, a short-term plan and a long-term plan. Short-term plan will keep all our buildings in inventory um, so we can uh, make sure we understand it in the district's inventory so we make sure, you know, over our long-term, um, if we need any of these sites, uh, which buildings uh, or sites we may repurpose later to be back in the school. In that period, um, there would be an interim use identified. We, We'll maintain all the buildings, we'll maintain all the grounds. We understand um, our uh, buildings, are rec the grounds around our building are recreational sites for the city. Um, those green spaces are important. Um, we have a great partnership uh, with uh, the Seattle Parks and Recreation Department who helps us um, make those uh, play fields available to all to neighborhoods in the community. That is completely oversubscribed. Um, there's more demand for our fields than we can accommodate now. So we'll continue to, uh, you know, and there'll probably be more availability if we're not operating a school there. But we'll assess each site and see, you know, long term, do we need to keep it in our inventory? Um, what kinds of programs could uh, exist at the building? Could there be auxiliary community centers? Could there be uh, perhaps opportunities for childcare and other types of programs? But we will work with the community um, in each, you know, surrounding each school. So what's the highest and best use for this property? And as enrollment, uh, we're, we're still a growing community, you know, over some long period of time, enrollment will uh, bounce back. And so uh, we'll, we'll study the carrying costs of those buildings and which would be, uh, if we need to bring more schools online at some point, you know, what is the timing for that and when would that occur? As Dr. Jones, Jones pointed out, 
um, even with 20 school consolidations at the elementary level, we'll still be only using 85% of the capacity of our buildings. So we, could, um, we can accommodate a lot of growth um, if we uh, right size to about 50 schools. Uh, another point is I've had the fortune to talk to Mayor Harrell about uh, us partnering to make sure that we're standing up these buildings as community assets. And so he's been forthright in trying to reach out and make sure that when we get to this point, if we get to this point, that we have this uh, collaboration with the city. So that's, a, that's an important feature as we go forward. Thank you. Next question is how do option schools factor in? So in our considerations, in our modeling, um, you've seen on the slides, we've talked about all schools serving students K through five. So that means we are considering all schools um, as part of how we are modeling out potential um, shifts, closures, and consolidations to create um, a, a, really a system of well-resourced schools. So they are part of the considerations. So we're gonna, thank you so much, appreciate it. We're gonna stick, so I will add the question is, is that a good consideration or a bad consideration? It is a consideration. So they are on the table. Does the school board have the opportunity to amend the presented plan and when can that happen within the timeline? I'll take that on. So the, the school board absolutely has the authority to amend uh, amend the plan. They can they can reject the plan. They can say go back and do more work. Uh, but they're they're going to be keen on on the guiding principles that uh, I shared with you. And so if the plan that we ultimately bring to the board is not adequate from from their perspective, they can send it back and say do more work. And so. Yes, the board has uh, full authority to make adjustments on that on that plan. Will each student receive a 1.0 counselor, a 1.0 librarian, and nurses? There's each student, no. Uh, potentially in the future, the school could each have that. It depends on the size. Part of the consideration here is for those who are somewhat policy wonks of the Seattle Public Schools, there's the weighted staffing standards model, which drives um, the staffing in the schools, uh, the way the funding is allocated to the schools. There's a group of principals and teachers who've been meeting this spring to, to revisit what that might look like going forward with a different system of schools. And so to, as that group is prioritizing its work, um, that would sort of be coming out of their work as to how the new staffing would look in this smaller system of smaller number of schools. And so I don't think there's, in the current system with the new, if the current weighted staffing standards model were in place, there would be some schools with a full-time counselor and the other nurse, um, but not all schools. And so I think it's a function of that group's work as to how that sort of manifests in the future. Yeah, and this, and this part of this entire effort is to bring the stability to, to staffing. We want to make sure that the right adults with the right professionals are in front of our students. Again, I talked about the student experience. We want to make sure we have the right mix uh, that's predictable and consistent as we go forward. And so this whole plan is predicated on making sure that we have uh, adequate support for our students. And so uh, that, that's our goal, and we're going to try to maximize the resources as much as possible. Thank you. The next question, what does inclusive learning look like? And I'm going to take a moment. This is something as a, I've a long time middle and high school principal, um, director of schools, and also director of special education in Seattle Public Schools. Um, inclusion, that is creating humanizing spaces where all students are general education students first and foremost, is absolutely essential to our mission and vision. The way we make that happen is by having strong professional collaboration alignment in terms of what we're teaching. And so some of the things we've talked about, having multiple teachers per grade level, actually facilitates that inclusion. So you can have both supports and extensions for every single student in every single classroom. Because you've worked with your third grade colleagues. You've looked at the math lessons. You've developed those, those extra um, opportunities to extend learning and support learning together. And that's what inclusive learning looks like. It looks like having uh, people who are strongly aligned, people who are working together. 
um, and being able to have all of our students learning together with the supports they need, but also the opportunities to grow. Dr. Mercer, did you want to speak to that? After school closures, will the budget be rebalanced? If not, what is the next plan? So the after school closures, school consolidations, uh, trying to create this system of well-resourced schools, no, the budget will not be balanced. However, we will be in a, a stronger position. We'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll have to rely on the legislature. Uh, we'll have to rely on uh, our more cuts, I'm sure, at some point. But the, the bottom line is we need to do this for longer-term stability. So we'll get the balanced budget for 24-25. We'll get that submitted. But as we go forward, we need to make sure that we're, again, using our resources wisely. We'll probably have about a $40 million gap still as we go into 25, 26. But that's, that's our intent to really have this be part of a set of uh, actions and activities. But we're going to need that, that gap to be closed uh, through the, our work with the legislature. Why are we building a new school, Alki, when we are closing schools? We need to consider building conditions. You know, the, uh, buildings um, get older. The, uh, the buildings we designed decades ago aren't large enough to accommodate a well-resourced school. So in considering school size, um, school environment, and building condition, um, you know, Seattle Public Schools will still be, if we uh, pursue this uh, proposal, still be operating 50 elementary schools. There will always need to be maintenance. Buildings will need to be replaced but um, we need to have the capacity so each school has the learning environment that can offer this comprehensive services in each neighborhood. And so we will still um, be constructing some new buildings. Do you anticipate consolidating middle and high schools in coming years as our K through fifth graders move through middle and high school? So this would be enough right now, <laughs> you know, so uh, I can, I can conceivably see that years out, but not in the short term. So uh, I can say emphatically, not in the, in the near term. That may be something that's required, but for the, for the time being, this, this would be enough for us to do right now. Thank you. And I think we've also discussed the fact that um, our suite of middle schools um, doesn't necessarily balance our suite of, our, sorry, suite of elementary schools doesn't balance our middle and high schools. Um, so what we're really doing is right-sizing the elementary component of our district. Right now, our middle and high schools potentially uh, lose a little bit of funding because we are running so many smaller elementaries. How will you address the loss of funding due to families unenrolling to private or charter elementaries that are smaller? And I will just say that in, in our studies and in our research, um, that that there typically is a small, smaller number of folks that, as we, as as other districts have closed schools, have seen that effect. Um, but we have calculated and factored that into all of our planning in order to be responsible, as we've been modeling. I don't know if somebody else wants to talk to that. In the past, families were told that teaching students in their home language would hurt their children's learning. Now we know that multilingualism is an asset, and cheers to that. It is truly um, an asset to be someone who's multilingual. Um, intellectually, cognitively, to be able to learn a content in two different languages, um, it, there's measurable uh, neurological effects on the brain. How will Seattle Public Schools continue to support dual language instruction programming? This is an equity, this is an equity and trauma healing issue, absolutely. So we, uh, we, we are aware of and in support of uh, the positive impact of students um, who come to us with that superpower of having two and sometimes even three languages, being able to learn those languages. So we will continue to have dual language programming throughout our, throughout our district. Um, we are looking, and I saw there was another question about the racial equity analysis tool. We are looking at those spaces where um, dual language is not accessible to our heritage speakers, to our students who actually speak another language. So we are looking at, as we design our new system, making sure that we are providing services and supports um, in those spaces that students have access to throughout our city. So I would say that that's something we want to make sure is built into the design of our system. 
um, so that it truly is equitably um, accessible throughout the city. I just want to add something about, uh, we've got questions about racial equity analysis. We do that ongoing. That's, that's part of our DNA. Uh, someone rightly uh, approached me a couple weeks ago and said, how come that's not listed in what you're doing? And it's become second nature to what we do. I think we do need to be explicit about talking about that, but I know there's been lots of questions about how will this impact our students of color for this educational justice? And we do this analysis ongoing, this formative analysis. We do this summatively. We were one of the nation's leaders in identifying doing racial equity work. Uh, and so what we haven't done is given ourselves credit for the work that we do on an ongoing basis. But I just want to reassure uh, this community that racial equity analysis is something that we do across the, across the board in all of our programs in Seattle Public Schools. Thank you. And, and a term, um, as I opened a middle school in Seattle Public Schools, we use the phrase, we want to be equitable by design. Um, we know that it, we, we have a school system that has evolved through the years and not always with a singular purpose and a singular vision, as Dr. Jones just um, described. So we have an opportunity to build back better and to build back with equity in our DNA and equity at the heart of all that we're doing. Well, resource schools take into consideration staff skills. Excellent observation. Many of our SPS teachers speak languages other than English. How will we use these skills to the benefit of our communities and the future of our children? Um, I think that's an excellent question. If anyone wants to speak to that. Absolutely. Um, you know, in a, in a perfect world, obviously everybody has choice where they want to be. In a situation like this, which it's not the most popular thing and nobody wants to do it, but it is necessary, unfortunately. Uh, to think about consolidating schools. I do believe that our, our teaching staff will still have a choice uh, in the matter of where they, uh, where they go to work um, and where they choose to serve um, and the, the particular sets of skills that they bring with them uh, to the learning communities that they serve. Um, and so this is, a, this is an, an ongoing, um, takes lots of thought, lots of preparation, lots of planning, lots of conversations with our labor partners to make sure that if this is something that we are, are, are moving forward with, uh, that we make the correct matches and the proper fit so that everyone benefits. Thank you, Dr. Mercer. What engagement, if any, has there been with state legislator, le legislature? What is their response? Yeah, so, so we have a legislative delegation that we, we meet with and we try to bring them up to speed on what we're dealing with internally uh, at, at the school level. We also give them insights as to from a policy perspective, what kind of support we need from them. And then we give them this, the, the clarity around the funding challenges. And so our legislative delegation has been responsive. They, they understand what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get accomplished. But this is one thing that I think we need you all to come partner with us in trying to be, speak boldly to our legislature around what are the needs of Seattle Public Schools. We're at a point now where we're talking about consolidating 20 schools. If that's not a, an alarm going off to say we're in a, in a situation where we need that support, I don't know what is. And so I'm hoping that you all will think about your voice and how you can elevate that as we try to make sure that basic education is funded. Uh, it's simply not. And so uh, we need that legislative support. It was, it's, been, it's been that way for a long time. We had, a, we had the McCleary Act a couple of years ago. That didn't fully fund it. We're still in that position where we need legislative support. So I, our legislators have, are listening to us. They've been supportive. I think they're, they're uh, aware of what the challenges are. Now it's really time to bring some resource forward so we can we can make sure that we don't just balance budget but we have adequate resources so our students have optimal experiences and so uh, we have been in touch uh, we will probably need to push even harder but they're uh, they've been responsive in terms of understanding what the what the challenges are but again I need you all to raise your hand if you are all are willing to make a, a plea if you will to the to the legislature so if you if you're all are willing to do that let's let's make it happen together thank you So we're gonna thank you. Sorry. Appreciate your voices. Yes. And so, so, so. Hold on. Hold on. I, I, if you if you want to make a speech, that's one thing. But if you want the answer, 
So we've been to, we've been to, I personally have been to the legislature. I personally have testified around things like regionalization funding. So I'm, I'll, I'll lead the charge with you all. There's a role I have to play in terms of superintendent. There's a line that I can't cross in terms of advocacy. But in terms of if you all want to go arm in arm around the things that we need to have happen, absolutely. You asked the question, will I be there? Yes. So I'm going to answer your question. A absolutely. I've, I've, I've been there. I've been there. I, I get it. I've been there. I don't know so. about the, that strategy around tax to rich and all that, but in terms of the, the ask of the legislature, I'll be, the, I'll be in the front of the charge. And so we need that. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your voice. Thank you. And we really do appreciate it. We appreciate your presence. We are trying to make sure that everyone who's here today um, has their voice heard and their question read. So thank you. Can I add a little bit to Please that? Please do. So part of the engagement just, that just happened, so I met yesterday with some members of the Appropriations Committee and some legislative staff. And one of the things I was able to do was to, and I was telling my table back there, the questions that are coming up in these forums, I'm passing those along to the legislature and having them um, hear what the folks are saying, what the concerns are. We're meeting, I think, with the Seattle delegation on Tuesday, sharing some of the things that are coming forward in these discussions. and so. The engagement that's happening is making a difference and will hopefully um, help fully fund education for the, the citizens of Seattle going forward. So thank, thank you. you for your engagement on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We've seen education levies not passed this year. What is the plan if the upcoming 2025 education levy in Seattle, its levies don't pass? And will there be additional consolidation? We are in denial about our levy not passing. You know, we, we, that's, that's not something that we're considering. Uh, we're, however, we're not taking it for granted. We, we've had our, our citizens, our residents uh, vote for the levy, almost 80% the last two levies that we've had. Uh, again, we're not taking that for granted, but we are not factoring in a levy failure. A levy failure would be devastating to us. Levies do so, much thing, so many things for our foundational work that we do from our, from our preschools to our buildings. Uh, it's, it's essential for us. And so one of the things I mentioned uh, earlier, talking about the concept of stability, uh, levies was one of those pieces. And so we want to make sure that we're communicating what the value proposition is, why that's so important as we go forward. But a levy failure is, n is not in our calculus. We cannot claim that. We, we have to pass our levies just to keep the lights on. So uh, that's, that's, that's my position on it. And, that, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you all will find that this is essential for us to move forward. So thank you. Please elaborate on how the Equity Lens Toolkit is being used to guide your decisions. Yeah, again, I spoke to that earlier. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a policy, 0030, it's around ensuring educational and racial equity. Part of that, what that calls for is us to use an equity, equity analysis. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing that across the board. Uh, but I know that there's a, a phrase that's being thrown around a lot now, show your work, show your work. I keep hearing that. I think we need can be, I think we can be explicit around uh, what we're doing with our equity analysis. But again, I just wanted to reassure uh, this community that we do equity analysis on everything that we do. And so uh, I, it, I know it's second nature, but I do think there's, a, there's an opportunity for us to show our documentation and show our analysis regarding that. Thank you. And one thing I would add, um, we think about the pain of school consolidation and school closure. Um, but in reality, in many of our schools, particularly our smaller schools, um, that pain is being felt right now. So as much as this might seem hard, throughout our system, we have students and families who do not have access to some of the things we think every student and family needs and deserves. So that's a critical foundational piece. Also, any recommendation that we make, um, we are required, but we would do it anyhow, to do a demographic um, an integration analysis of the impact of those changes. So what I can tell you is that in all of the scenarios that we've run, if we have seen a scenario where there is a disproportional impact to our students and families of color, students and families for furthest from educational justice, we have moved off of that particular model and looked to another model where that impact is not disproportional. Assuming our school will be consolidated, will students and teachers be able to move together to maintain our school communities and relationships. Also, please describe transportation plans. So I can speak a little bit to that. Um, 
there, there is likely not a school in the city that won't be impacted in some way. Some schools will be receiving new students. Some schools will be closing. Um, so we will do our best, and I see our, our uh, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources here to make a plan where staff can travel and families can travel in a way that maximizes their strengths, maximizes relationships. Um, again, we're still, we don't have a finalized, the school board will finalize that list, but when we do, those will be plans that we will put into action in terms of where staff, students, and families are traveling and if they're able to travel together. As far as transportation goes, we are not changing our walk zones. We're not changing our criteria and our basic transportation service standards. Um, students who will continue to qualify for transportation based on those standards, um, and, and those things will remain the same as we transition. And when will new boundaries be announced for schools that are closing? So at the time, again, remember that we have a timeline that we're going through um, where we're making final decisions. But as we present um, a possible plan, we will also be sharing um, an updated um, uh, address lookup tool on our website so that you will be able to look that information up. Let me, let me do a process check. Um, these questions, are they reflective of what you all wanted to hear? Is this, is this accurate or are, there, are we wanting a whole different set of uh, responses to some different questions? Is this, is this adequate? Give me a thumbs up if this is, okay, okay. I'm seeing some both. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna ask for folks to submit more questions if you have them. Uh, we don't have all day to be here to, to talk about the questions. However, we wanna be responsive to that. We also have a FAQ that we're working, that we're populating, that we're maturing. Each session that we have, each question that we get, we start to include that in our FAQs. So our goal is to be responsive. And so that's why I wanted to do the process check. If it's, if it's not adequate, we want to make sure that we're responsive. So we're going to keep going in for another uh, five minutes or so, but we want to make sure that we, we capture your questions as we go forward. Oh, I love this. Yeah, come on. We're we going we to answer this question. Did you write this question? All right, here, I'm gonna figure out which one you answered. Let's see. Uh, what is a real life example of a well-resourced school? That's the, see, that's why student engagement is so, so critical. Uh, so we don't have, we, I don't know if we have necessarily a, a singular well-resourced school. Uh, but we want to have a system of well-resourced schools. And so we had a slide up earlier around having uh, stable staffing, having PE, uh, art, and uh, music. You know, these are, these are things that community said was a, was a well-resourced school. I think we probably, if we did an analysis, we could point to some well-resourced schools. But the point is, I'm, I'm making is, we need to have a whole system of well-resourced schools so that the whole district has those, uh, the student experience that they can walk into our school and have the adequate services and programs. And so uh, I'm sure we have a well-resourced school or, or, or two or five or 20 uh, in our district right now, but we wanna make sure that that's consistent across the board. So thank you for your question, sir. And I think with that, we're having one more question, possibly one more. Thank you. <laughs> Which decisions about consolidations have not been made and therefore do you seek suggestions? Go ahead, Fred. I know we um, distributed the slide deck and Dr. Jones talked about the guiding principles that we're using um, to drive a, a potential recommendation. Again, we're not making decisions right now. We're just trying to assemble a recommendation. So the mo I think one of the most helpful things would be any feedback you have on those guiding principles. If there's something you think we're overlooking in terms of is there something need to be added to those guiding principles while this um, recommendation gets uh, refined and, and finalized. And again, it, it's only a recommendation. We keep hearing the word decision. Um, the uh, Seattle School Board of Directors will make a decision about this, and that is uh, pretty far down the road. We're just really starting to tee this up. 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm good. Thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. Thank you for the concerns. Thank you. We understand the passion. We understand the importance of this particular moment, and we don't take it lightly. As we are preparing to wrap, want to make sure that we draw, our atten draw your attention to a survey that we do have going online, that's another place for you to add additional input, those guiding principles that Mr. Podesta just spoke of, as well as what would you like to see help us through this particular process. That email has been sent. We will continue to send it, and it will remain open through the life of these particular information sessions. Again, thank you for giving us your Saturday. Thank you for giving us your time. Please be safe, and we will see you soon. We have a Zoom session coming up on Tuesday. It is our largest session. We're expecting about 500 attendees. Thank you so much.